trash can and all of a sudden. Well, I hate to disturb the great conversation, but it's time to begin. Um, first, I want to thank, thank Justin Brown for his continued dedication in filming all of our faculty forums. Uh, he's learned more about faculty. He's learned more about faculty than he ever cared to know. Uh, we're grateful that he's here. And uh, I'll be checking on uh, getting you the information on how you can access all of those because we've had some really good ones now. I know Mark's will be the same. I was thinking this morning about how I would introduce Mark, and since Stacy Patty's not here, I can use the perfect job. Um, several years ago, I asked Mark to do a uh, summer professional development uh, hour lecture, and he wanted to talk about Ecclesiastes, and he began with pictures of great pessimists throughout the ages, and I was sitting there thinking, this would be perfect if you put Stacey's Patty's picture up, and so I said, um, there it was, <laughs> the, and it was a pretty good audience, about 45 people, and everyone was off to laughter, and Stacey was kind of looking at us like, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that's when I knew, I had suspected all along, but that's when I knew Mark and I had the same purposes, uh, so I appreciate that. Every time I've heard him talk, not to put any pressure on him, but uh, I've always been amazed at the depth of his wisdom and also the depth of his humor. And I know that today's talk will be a really good one. So, Mark, we're turning it over to you, and then later we'll have questions. Okay. Thank you. Good. All right. I want to thank Susan for inviting me to uh, do this today. Uh, I've, I've attended, I'm, I'm glad you set this up, these faculty forums, and I've attended several of them and have really enjoyed them. Uh, but to be honest, I, I found this endeavor a little bit uncomfortable, and it's not because I'm so humble, <laughs> but uh, rather to be honest, I would have preferred to have remained a mystery. <laughs> and... After the presentation today, there will probably be several of you that uh, will wish <laughs> the same. So, I do have a disclaimer. Uh, because of the, the nature of these forums, focus on the spiritual and academic journey, I'm not really going to say a, a whole lot about my immediate family. But uh, just like you guys, you know, at the core of my identity, is my family. So I just want to make sure, um, because there's not much about them that that means they're not important in my life. They're of the most importance. So the structure of my talk today is going to be um, mm -hmm. created by an answer to the question, who am I? And they're just like the rest of you, um, there are many facets to me. And I've picked out four things I want to talk about that I think will reveal uh, the core of who I am academically and spiritually. First of all, I'm a hillbilly um, or a descendant of hillbillies. And I'm sure there's, a, there's some steels, distilleries involved with my ancestors a few generations back. Uh, I was born in Nashville, and I was raised in the suburbs of Nashville, uh, progressively east of Nashville, which is toward the, the mountains in uh, East Tennessee. And uh, sometimes my hillbilly comes out, and I've got a group of friends where uh, sometimes I break out into the Tennessee dialect, uh, which is uh, c the dialect in Kentucky and Tennessee is more nasal. They call it the Tennessee twang. And uh, I've also lived in Mississippi, which is part of the deep south. And they don't have that twang, which is interesting. The accent is very similar. Uh, a little bit, uh, the, what I call the southern bell drawl that, that they have. Uh, but uh, I've become fascinated with dialects. I lived up in New Jersey for four years, so the... The, all the different Yankee uh, dialects, but especially the Southeast, I've become uh, sort of an aficionado of the dialects. And I like to watch TV and hear someone talk and try to figure out, 
if they're from the southeast, you know, what particular uh, state they're from. And um, Steve Bonner's wife, Amy, is, she's from west of Tennessee. And, um, I, you know, when I hear her talk, uh, my ears begin to twitch because, <laughs> you know, we're from, we're from the same culture and it's, uh, it's the same dialect. Um, the southern Georgia dialect is represented by the show Honey Boo Boo. <laughs> and uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that one day flipping through the channels, I watched a few minutes of that. But what's more embarrassing is I didn't need the subtitles. <laughs> so... Uh, this is a picture of me. I was about four. It looks like it was made during the, de the Depression. Um, but, uh, that's my grandfather's hand, and he's g giving me coffee. You know, I've been drinking coffee since the, I was very, very small. And uh, I've got hand-me-downs on. Those were my, uh, my uncle's, just a plain white shirt. This was about 1964, so I know I'm, uh, I'm dating myself, but I'm at my grandfather's house, and he lived in, the, in Nashville and uh, would visit uh, his house frequently. I was very close to my grandfather, and um, he was one of 12 children, and his father was a sharecropper, so he, I heard lots of stories about working out in the fields. And uh, later on in his life, he uh, uh, became, he worked for Purity Dairy, and Purity Dairy is sort of like um, Bluebell, out here, and the ice cream is famous for being really, really good. It's, it's the best quality. And uh, so he, he retired from there, and I would often visit him at the dairy. He was the cheesemaker. Makes me think of the, Mon is it the Monty Python movie? But uh, <laughs> anyway, he's originally from Springfield, uh, Tennessee, which is so, uh, up north, uh, I think north, yeah, just north of Nashville. And my, uh, this is my maternal grandparents are the ones that I was closest to. My grandmother lived in Ashland City, and Ashland City is where the famous Don Williams, I was hoping Don would be here today, uh, is from the country singer who's uh, also a member of the church. So um, my parents weren't that educated. Um, my mother was very, very smart intellectually. She still is. She's still around. And uh, she was actually salutatorian at uh, David Lipscomb High School. Um, but she decided not to go to college. She wanted to learn a craft. So she became a cosmetologist. And, uh, and then my father attempted college. And he went for two years at, at Tennessee Tech in Cookville and flunked out. So uh, when I grew up, my parents were, um, at, you know, they, were, they encouraged me to make really good grades, but um, they just didn't want, want me to go to an extreme with it. So, you know, good grades were important, but uh, that's, that's about as far as it went. I, I grew up mainly in uh, Mount Juliet, Tennessee, and the indigenous people say Mount Juliet. And... Uh, uh, Mount Juliet's claim to fame is Charlie Daniel, there. And uh, I worked at a grocery store. It was called Al's Food Center in Mount Juliet. And he would shop during the day where there wouldn't be a, a big crowd. And I would sack his groceries. And uh, his hand actually brushed up against mine at one point. Um, but uh, he, was a good, he was a good tipper, by the way. So... Anyway, again, trying to get you to understand the culture that I grew up in. Um, you, my friends often hear me talk about I worked at the original Cracker Barrel. And matter of fact, I went to school with the daughter of the man who started the Cracker Barrels. And it's that, you know, Tennessee cuisine. They, they draw on all the southeast, but it, it might primarily come, the buttermilk biscuits and all of that. And I was a busboy. And it was during high school, I would play football, and then on the weekends, I'd be a busboy here to make a little money, pay for my car and gas and that kind of thing. 
but uh, I, uh, it was rough work. But uh, they had just started branching out. There were like two or three others. But this was the original Cracker Barrel, and it had a gas station with it back then. And uh, it, it had to close its doors. It's no longer there. They, actually, they moved it to Lebanon, which is up north uh, or east of uh, this region right here. But I'll never forget they were filming Coal Miner's Daughter. And uh, Sissy Spacek and the bus came by, and, and, and she ate at the Cracker Barrel, and they had a big table. And I remember seeing her, I don't, she is so tiny. I remember thinking she's so fragile. But, you know, Tommy Lee Jones, the, the movie about Loretta Lynn, and uh, she's, uh, she's actually uh, from East Tennessee. And uh, she had a restaurant as well. She still has a restaurant, I think, that's in East Tennessee. But. Now, Jeff Carey uh, makes fun of me uh, because I love Cracker Barrel. Anytime I travel with colleagues or whatever, I usually, if there's a Cracker Barrel, off the interstate, I try to get him to go there, and I like the food. And he's uh, okay. Yeah. And uh, he's, he says he says it's a geriatric establishment. And uh, um, I try not. I try not to make uh, old folk uh, jokes anymore because I, as I'm aging. I'm realizing that they're going to come back to haunt me. So, and I think in a decade or two, even Jeff will, you know, wise up and begin to realize why, why old people actually go to such establishments and might find it more attractive. Okay. All right. Who am I? I'm Church of Christ through and through. Uh, I claim deep pedigree. My uh, maternal grandmother's father was an elder in the church. And um, matter of fact, her uncle uh, was also a member. And I remember she took me to this old chest and she opened the lid and she pulled out this Bible. And I've heard lot, lots of stories along these lines. But he was in the uh, Civil War and uh, there was a bullet hole in, in the Bible. And he had it in his, in his pocket, and she said that it saved his life. And she opened it up, and I'll never forget looking at the uh, person had given him this Bible and signed it. And, or, or it wasn't a person, it was the church, and it was the Christian church. And so this was uh, mid-19th uh, century before the split in the first part of the 20th century. So uh, deep pedigree. And then I attended the Mount Juliet Church of Christ. This is the new building, and the, uh, Mount Jude has changed a lot theologically. It's much more progressive now, but uh, I think even Jesse uh, has, has been to Mount Ju Juliet, and you went to Lipscomb, and you, you know this area. And, uh, but when I grew up, the, the people were wonderful. They were very loving, but the, the, the theology was pretty bad. It was very legalistic. Um, I had a heavy dose of fire and brimstone sermons, and 99% of the sermons were how the various dominations, denominations were going to hell. So uh, that probably explains some of my uh, psychology as, as we go along today, and I talk about uh, that. I was in, very impressed when I was young by the gospel preachers that would come, their charisma, um, of course, they were what's called proof texting constantly, and, and they, would, they had all this scripture memorized and would spit it out like a machine gun. Uh, it was very impress, impressive, and that made an impression on me. Um, we even had some guest speakers. I remember a speaker who came and showed a uh, film about the footprints in the riverbed near Glen Rose, Texas, of the, supposedly the human footprints in the dinosaur. And that was really intriguing. I was pretty young, and it, you know, so I was introduced to the creation um, evolution controversy. And so when I was young, I was kind of thinking, what do I want to be? Maybe I want to be a preacher. Uh, so when I was young, maybe into high school. Who am I? I'm a late blooming intellectual. Okay. Now, maybe some of you won't believe this, but. 
I was not planning to go to college. And um, there was a member at the Mount Juliet Church that had sort of been a mentor to me and had talked me into, you know, the, the Hartsville Nuclear Plant was nearby. And um, I applied to enter the steam fitter apprenticeship program that they had and was accepted. And this, it was the uh, spring of 1979. I, I was ready to go as soon as I graduated from high school that fall um, or, or even that summer, I was just, I was going to begin and uh, learn that trade, be, become a part of that guild. And this is the Hartsville Nuclear Plant today. And it's basically a, a ghost town. And it was that very spring when it, they closed it. And I was working at a grocery store, uh, and I knew I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. So my parents said, you know, why don't you just go to Lipscomb and see what happens? And uh, I actually loved it, and I thrived uh, there. So there were little signs that uh, I was an intellectual uh, as a child in, in junior high school. Uh, I was always an avid reader. I didn't read the classics, but I was always reading something. I remember my aunt bought uh, the Childcraft encyclopedias, and I memorized those. I loved the pictures. I, I loved the dinosaurs and the solar system, and um, that was very influential. In junior high, I took Spanish. I picked up the language pretty quickly, especially the pronunciation. And uh, the teacher there, she's the best teacher I ever, ever have had, period. She was actually priming me to, for the competitions that they had. But third year Spanish, I dropped out. And uh, it was mainly um, the culture there. And then um, uh, both of my parents, but especially my father, kind of pushed me towards sports, you know, not intellectual things. And, uh, you, know, you know, football was a rite of passage in that part of the country. And, I mean, if you played basketball even or, or baseball, you weren't quite a man. Uh, so you had to play football. I mean, you could play the other sports, but you had to play football. So my father especially kind of repressed, helped repress the, I think, my intellectual nature. He meant well, but uh, that, uh, that, that's what happened. And... Um, there was even a little bit of skepticism early on that developed in me. I remember I went to a Christian high school, and the biology teacher, Judy Green, for some reason she showed us this film, and it was about the Grand Canyon, and it was a geological uh, film. And I remember seeing the layers and the fossils and how they start off very simple, and then they, the complexity increases as, as you go up to younger uh, strata. And uh, the, the narrator was talking about this took millions and millions of years. And I was the only one in the class that went to her after the class in, my, in, in the classroom. And we were alone. And I, and I said, how do, you, how do you square this film with Genesis 1? And she just looked at me and she said, uh, you know, either you believe or you don't. You know, you've just got to have faith in Scripture. And uh, so I was introduced to fideism, even, even though I didn't know uh, that term at the time. And uh, so uh, and that, that connects with the creation evolution uh, controversy that I had been uh, interested in earlier. So. so at Lipscomb, I thrived. Um, I started off as a preacher, <coughs> preaching major. I had several classes under Batzel Barrett Baxter, and again, I'm aging myself. These were the last couple of years of his life that he taught there. And I took his Christian Evidences class, and it was really good. And I went and talked with him. He kind of uh, took me under his wings, and I talked to him about the problems I was having with evolution, and he gave me some books, and he talked with me, and they helped a little bit, but not uh, completely. And then uh, Rubel Shelley started teaching at uh, Lipscomb. And his classes just sort of, they blew my mind. And he broadened my perspective quite a bit. And uh, matter of fact, I almost had a minor in philosophy. Really enjoyed uh, his classes. 
And um, he ended up getting fired at Lipscomb. And I heard that one of the reasons was that Rubel kept wanting to debate atheists on campus. And uh, the administrators didn't like that. And so that kind of fanned the flame of my skepticism a little bit because I was thinking, what do they have to fear? And it hurt me that they uh, let him go. Um, so there was, there was a transformation in me at Lipscomb from preacher toward professor. Uh, I was moving in that direction. And I wanted to major in apologetics and Christian evidences. And uh, the philosophy was a good background for that. I didn't take any science classes. But um, I was a biblical languages major. So that pushed me in, in the direction of a, of a professorship. Um, as a matter of fact, I was planning to go to the Tennessee Bible College in Cookville, Tennessee, and get a PhD in apologetics and Christian evidence. It wasn't accredited, but that's what I wanted to do. And fortunately, there was a Harding Graduate School alum, alum who was also a preacher, sort of a mentor to me, and he took, um, he took me out to lunch, and he persuaded me to not go there, but go to uh, Harding Graduate School of Religion. That's what it was called back then. Now it's the Harding School of Theology. I had Harold Hayslip. I actually had him for his very last class. They even had little t-shirts you could buy. <laughs> it was on uh, Christian ethics. And I took a philosophy, uh, his philosophy of religion class. And basically I got disenchanted with uh, philosophy of religion. Um, I did a paper on the problem of evil. And I read atheists and theists, you know, countering each other. And to me, it was clear a lot of the arguments were semantic. And they were just word games. And I thought, if this is philosophy, if this is apologetics, I don't want any part of it. And so I kind of turned from that area toward the biblical text, you know, something a little more concrete. Um, I kind of wish I hadn't done that, if you want to be honest, if I could be honest, because... Uh, I really think I'm, I have more of a philosopher's heart. I, I'm an abstract thinker. I'm a big picture uh, person. So, you know, I like some detail, but I, I like to see the big picture. And um, so I kind of uh, hastily generalized and thought all of philosophy was like that. And I've come to find out le later on as I study more philosophy that that's not the case, that there's some really good philosophy. So uh, in, in another life. Uh, I, I could have been a philosopher, I think. So, um, uh, this, uh, I, I turned to the Old Testament, especially at, at uh, Harding Graduate School, because that's the, that's the section of the Bible that, had, that has the most problems. You've got the creation accounts, you've got the genocide, um, the, the Israelites killing the Canaanites and Joshua and also in Judges. You've got all these moral uh, problems to deal with in the Old Testament. So I'm, I, my apologetic passion was turned in that direction. And um, I was enchanted by the wisdom literature. I had a wonderful class by Jack Vansel. And it makes sense because the wisdom literature of the Bible is the most philosophical. And it deals with ethics and Ecclesiastes and Job are, are more philosophical. And of course, I was introduced to Ecclesiastes. And there, there it was. Uh, here was a book in the Bible, a skeptic within the Bible that sort of legitimated my own doubts. My own, and yet he, he was a biblical author. And um, I kid around with the students and some of my friends sometimes and tell them that I am, uh, the, the Hebrew name for Ecclesiastes is Kohelet. I am Kohelet incarnated. <laughs> and in fact, I have an email address, kohelet at nts-online.net. So I don't know if you knew that or not. But, uh, uh, so there's the passion for uh, Ecclesiastes. Who am I? Finally, I am a teacher and a minister. Uh, after I got my doctorate, there's Ecclesiastes for you. Fascinating book. Um, there's Drew. My first full-time teaching position was at Magnolia Bible College, and this is in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, which is named after Thaddeus Kosciuszko, the Polish general who fought for uh, Washington during the uh, Revolutionary Wars. And uh, 
how, how, how Kosciuszko came down to the Deep South, that name is uh, interesting. I don't know the full history there. But anyway, you can tell the lushness is very, very humid, plenty of rainfall. It's almost like a, a, a tropical forest in, in this area. And uh, this, was a rec this is a recent picture, and unfortunately, they had to close their doors. They had about 50 uh, students when I was uh, teaching there. And at one time, it was the smallest school accredited by Sachs. And, uh, but it's had to close its doors. And uh, there's Kosciuszko in, right in the middle of Mississippi. And um, you may find this surprising, but I was their New Testament person. <laughs> they had Ray Pasuer, who was their Old Testament person. He wasn't really qualified to teach Old Testament. They had him teaching Old Testament because he went to Israel. His dissertation was on the Israeli educational system. So he knew Hebrew, but he had, he had never really done a PhD work on, in biblical studies in Old Testament. So I was the New Testament guy. I also taught uh, uh, geography and psychology and sociology <laughs> and church history and theology and a little bit of everything else. So it was actually a good experience for me. I don't know how the students fared. But uh, anyway, uh, I was there for six years and I preached at this church. This was the uh, Oak Ridge Church of Christ in French Camp, Mississippi. I had about 50 on Sunday morning, and well, not that much, more like 30 to 35. Um, all the members were loggers. The, the men were loggers, and they owned their own logging uh, companies, and so um, they were very loving people. I went through a divorce at this time, and they were very supportive of me, and I'll never forget that. And, uh, but uh, as far as benefiting me and my teaching skills, I had to learn to simplify. I had to learn how to use illustrations. And so I think that uh, that has been important for me in my, my teaching, honing my teaching skills. I was there, I was here for four years, and then uh, I was a year at Southern Christian University. It changed its name to Amridge. And this is the, this, I couldn't find a picture, I went Google, couldn't find any of the old pictures. This is a new building, so I've never actually been here. Uh, but this is what Amridge looks like in Montgomery, Alabama. And uh, was there only for a year because um, it, was, uh, it was the Bible faculty and most of the faculty, in fact, left after that year because we couldn't, we couldn't get along. We couldn't work under Rex Turner, Jr., who is Jesse's uncle. And he can tell you stories about that. He, can't, he couldn't work with him either. <laughs> so uh, I left, and uh, very fortunate that I came to LCU. So the question I want to end with in just the next couple of minutes is, why am I here at LCU? I'm hesitant to say that God brought me here uh, because I'm uncomfortable with, you know, um, you, know, pin, you know, pinning God down as to what He does and what He doesn't do. Uh, some of you in here may even think that He definitely didn't <laughs> bring me here. Um, but what I can say is that Jesse Long brought me here. And so if God didn't bring me here, you can blame Him. <laughs> Uh, Jesse was at the doctoral program at Drew. He was working on his dissertation when I came to Drew. And there was another great guy there, uh, Randy Bailey. And, and they both helped me out tremendously. I'd never touched a computer before in 1986 when I came to Drew. And Jesse and Randy introduced me. Was it WordPerfect and uh, Q, the QX16 Epson computers and all that business? I'm dating myself. But uh, they helped me out. I fell in love with Randy and especially Jesse. And we've been friends ever since. And I know during the interview process, there were other candidates just as qualified, if not more qualified than me. So I know I'm here because of Jesse. And he may not want me to uh, acknowledge that, but uh, I will be eternally grateful that, that you brought me here because... Uh, Things weren't good at NBC and also at Southern Christian. So my academic life, at least, uh, owes its existence to Jesse Long. 
So, to finish, I didn't become that preacher, that full-time preacher. Um, I didn't become the pipe fitter. Um, I didn't even become the uh, um, expert in apologetics and Christian evidences. But I did become an Old Testament professor. I have a passion for the biblical text, especially the wisdom literature. Yes, Ecclesiastes. Uh, I still love philosophy, still read philosophy. Um, and when I teach the students here at LCU, and I learned this at Harding Graduate School and Drew, I try to get them to read the Bible uh, on its own terms. And that means not through Western scientific eyes, but sort of going back in time and reading that literature in terms of the ancient Near Eastern milieu, the history, uh, the literary uh, conventions of the time. And, and, I, and I emphasize to them that we can't understand what God's word is for us today, what the Bible means today, unless we first, unless we can, unless we first determine what it meant for the original audience. And so you have to go back and sort of, um, what's the, the word, not absorb, but just sort of um, uh, immerse yourself in that ancient culture. And that's what I'm passionate about today. So I, I've ended up focusing on the nature of Scripture in the end. Um, apologetics, I certainly see as a legitimate field, but my passion has shifted more toward Old Testament and, and especially the wisdom literature. Thank you. So I'll remind us that the rule is that I get to ask the first question. Mm -hmm. Just a gentle reminder as we begin this year's faculty forum. Not you, Craig, but just me. Um, so if I'm reading your maps right, you spent most of your life in a very tight circle in the South except for a few journeys east. So... And Drew, up in New Jersey. Okay, for four so years. what about moving to Lubbock, Texas and <clears throat> becoming a Texan? Are you a Texan? Unfortunately, I'm a pilgrim. I'm a hillbilly <laughs> pilgrim <laughs> who resides in Texas. So I might even be buried here, but I think my heart will always be in Tennessee. Well, and I'll say, I'll, I'll ask the second question. You didn't tell us what your dissertation was. You can guess that. Ecclesiastes, it was... Uh, Do you so, remember the title? Oh, the title. Oh, uh, wow. The, let's see. The Social Location of Kohelet's Thought. And it was a sociological exploration of the, looking at the pessimism and the skepticism of the book and explaining it in terms of the, the milieu and what was going on. I, I drew primarily on Emil Durkheim and his theory of integration, mm -hmm. which is uh, sociologists and social theories still use it today. So it's, it's valid. But I basically determined that Kohelet himself was alienated or the Jews in general were alienated and that's the pessimism stems from that. That was the original dissertation, and I've revised it and gone in a different direction. Interesting. Other questions? Uh -huh. I will preface by saying I, I learned of Mark's humor in a class, in our Sunday school class in Monterey. He was teaching, and he asked me, he said, Sean, would you read this passage? <laughs> and it was full of tongue-twisting Hebrew names that I couldn't <laughs> even, and he just sat there and chuckled as I worked my way through this. Um, <laughs> But I run into you frequently out on the mall working on your book. So what's your current book that you're working on? Uh, it's, it's, uh, I've I have a contract with Fortress Press, and it's uh, The Social World of the Sages, and it's uh, an undergraduate textbook on the wisdom literature that will include uh, Proverbs, Job, Ecclesiastes, and then two apoc apocryphal works, uh, or one pseudographical. Uh, Sirach and then Wisdom of Solomon. So it'll be five books. 
But I'm spinning, uh, I've got some, several chapters before I even look at those books where I talk about that culture and the honor shame culture. That, and that's an, sort, sort of an anthropological approach that's never really been done with the wisdom literature. Oh, also, I'm editor. I'm the sole editor of an anthology that's going to be published by the Society of Biblical Literature called Is There a Wisdom Tradition? Uh, new uh, Prospects in uh, uh, Wisdom Studies. It's close to the title. And uh, we've got uh, uh, about 15 contributors, so is some from Israel. Germany, Great Britain, and America, and uh, s several of them are the foremost wisdom literature experts in the world. And uh, we're kind of rattling the cage of the, uh, an old paradigm that says that the wisdom literature is this sort of insular, idiosyncratic tradition in the Old Testament that doesn't really belong, and it contradicts or it's in tension with the prophetic literature and the legal material like the law and the historical literature. And several of us in the anthology are countering that and saying, no, it, it meshes in very, very well. It's just a diff it's looking at a different slice of reality than the other types of literature. So I've been pretty busy. Yeah. Um, reflecting back on your path to your vocational choices, besides your educator experiences, did, did you feel like your family made a huge difference in, in choosing that pathway for you as well? It, uh, like my parents, is that, yeah, yeah, my parents were very, uh, very religious. They were Christian, um, and so, uh, and I was there every 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 time the church doors were open, and so uh, I was enamored with the Bible, the power of the Bible, and those speakers, those gospel meetings that we had, Amen. and uh, so I wanted to know about this most powerful book in the world and what is its nature and uh, so that's where the um, passion comes from but I'm, I, I see myself as reacting to a lot of that rigid legalism I'm constantly reacting to that that's why again I like Ecclesiastes there, I have a subversive streak I don't know if you I try to keep that concealed so, so, so how, how old is the earth? <laughs> Only God knows. <laughs> That's origin. Origin. Like that. Quote. So, are your parents both still alive? Both. And, and they're both they in pretty good health. Having a PhD as a son. Yeah. They've even become more conservative. <laughs> and so, uh, when I go home, we don't talk religion. And. Um, they, they, as a matter of fact, they attend a church that uh, has tea party meetings in the basement regularly. And the last time I visited, I opened one of the bulletins, and it wasn't filled with scripture. It was filled with quotes from the founding fathers. <laughs> well, you're a historian. Sorry. Um, so, uh, politically and religiously, I, we just, it just, they're proud of me. But I didn't give him. I didn't even give them a copy of my book because I, I knew I know I know they wouldn't read it and they would shelve it away. So unfortunately, yeah, we kind of have a strained relationship. I love them. I, I I contact them on a regular basis, but it's a little strained. Do you have any brothers and sisters? Two sisters. Yeah. One one lives in Lebanon, Tennessee, and she's a cosmetologist. She's a hairdresser. And she's she she has the opposite personality of me, very gregarious. She's, she's crazy. And then, um, she's uh, uh, three years younger me, than me. And then I have another sister that lives in Benton, Kentucky. And uh, she used to be like an accountant. And uh, she's uh, she's in Benton, Kentucky, which is just north of the Tennessee boundary. And uh, she's recently remarried. And, I'm more like her in, in demeanor. She did really well in school, but she married young, and it kind of took her in a path where she couldn't really finish uh, what she was doing. about your, your children and 
Oh, we well, we have six all together. It's a mixed uh, family, and they it's it, the range is seventeen to thirty three, and um, um, we have three of the children are here in Lubbock now, and uh, we have three grandchildren, and they're all from, it's Arlene's uh, biological children. Um, we have Jace, it's the girl, and then we have uh, the boy named, his name is Rebel. And he lives up to his name. And um, his, my stepson it's his, is his father, and, and that comes from the old Miss. They don't even have that mascot anymore, do they? But anyway, he's Rebel, and he's a character. Yeah, I thought they got a, a different one. They got a new one. I don't think so. Maybe it's not in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, and then uh, Atley is the youngest grandchild, and he's uh, about, uh, he's almost three. As a matter of fact, we're keeping two of the grandkids tonight. My stepdaughter is going back, coming back to school, and she's going to LCU tuition free because I've been here since the dinosaurs. And uh, we help her with the kids, and she's uh, majoring in uh, uh, general business. And uh, she attempted to come here years ago, but flunked out. Didn't do. Uh, didn't go to chapel. <laughs> so she realizes this is her last chance. But uh, and then my bio biological children, Luke and Lauren, live in North Carolina. Luke is a corpsman in the Navy, and I'm. They're attending a nursing program there. I tried to get them. I almost had them convinced to come here. Uh, Luke eventually will come here because he, he, can, he wants to get the, the, the uh, degree and not just the, the diploma. Um, and then I have a son in Boston. He's a Ph.D. candidate in chemistry at Boston College, and he's an inorganic chemist, nanotechnology. He, uses, he showed me the electron microscope a few weeks ago when I was up there, and uh, he's just doing really well. He's already got, like, I know I'm bragging, Five articles published, wow. and he has he didn't have the doctorate yet. But of course, they're co-authored, you know, in the sciences. So, but he's the first author on two of them, and one a uh, couple of the uh, one, two of the articles are in Jacks, which is supposed to be a yeah. I've heard a prestigious yeah. mm -hmm. chemistry journal of something chemistry American American Chemical Society. Yeah, American yeah. Society. So, and is he church proud? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, yeah, uh, my children. I, I uh, had sole custody of them for like six years, and then they finally decided they wanted to go live with their mom because there were no rules. It was a better situation, and we had just combined as this large family, and they felt like I wasn't giving them the attention that I, well, I wasn't, that I used to get, because I was trying to be fair. Anyway, they've been influenced that way, and so, no, he, he's, I don't think he attends anywhere. So. But he has those roots. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. That could flourish again if the appropriate yes. nourishment key factors. <clears throat> so I was going to say what makes you happy, but I don't want to be fair. I'll ask a real question. Um, what, what do you really enjoy about working with your Students, what are some of those moments when like, oh, this is what I love about teaching? Oh, like, you know, this morning we were looking at some of the aphorisms in, in the, my poetry and wisdom class. That's my favorite class, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in, beginning in chapter 10 of Proverbs and just looking at some of those aphorisms closely and in detail. L we looked at some of these aphorisms that um, had cultural elements in them that are distinct from our own culture a little bit different like winking the eye what does this mean and uh, a reference to some kind of vinegar um, that we don't have in our culture and just some unusual phrases and concepts and um, I would ask a question and I just let the students of course it's hard eight o'clock in the morning to have that kind of class but just to see them the gears turning in their minds and finally getting it, not just the culture, but I, uh, the literary features of these proverbs. I try to show them how they're so nicely, beautifully crack, crafted. There's an aesthetic 
element. They have a moral element, but also an aesthetic and a cognitive element. Those combined, that they're, they're, they're very powerful. And, and we talked about how, do, how would we apply these? How would you teach this in a Sunday school? So just this, this morning, I got pretty excited about all that. And it, I wasn't charismatic, and I didn't have a PowerPoint. You know, I was just sitting there at my desk, and they, were, they had the Bibles open. And I had the, uh, the Hebrew, the um, olive tree on the iPad, the Hebrew, which is fantastic, where I could go back and forth if I a Hebrew word I didn't know. And uh, it was nice. Very so, satisfying. Speaking of all that, have you ever thought about doing your own translation to try to highlight or bring out some of those features of the text? Yeah, I know, I know you've done translating. I, ha I haven't really thought about doing translating. Um, Hebrew is more of a tool for me than it is um, a passion. I mean, I teach it and I enjoy it. Um, but uh, it's more of a tool, and, and I like it. But uh, I don't, that's, that's a thought. You know, a lot of times when, if, you were, if I was asked to write a commentary, mm -hmm. I'd have to translate it. So, yeah. so I might get to do that. Uh, how, how do you explain your fascination with the horror genre of movies and so forth? <laughs> uh, <laughs> now I'm going to have to talk about therapy. <laughs> um, when I was when I was smaller, I was uh, I, lo I loved monsters, and I in my own family, I was a little bit alienated. And that, uh, you know, people that go go goth are often alienated to some degree, and it's it's a it's a source of power. So uh, even though it's a fantasy kind of power, but you know, monsters are incredibly strong, powerful. What's, they what's your, what's they your never favorite, die. Huh? What's your, what's your favorite category? The grotesque. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I, right now, I'm, I know this is old, but uh, interview with a vampire, I'm reading Anne Rice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm reading the book. The book is better than the movie. I thought you might have a pension for Zombies, I do love zombies. The undead. And psychologists say these zombie movies are, uh, they've been studied so socially and psychologically that they're often apocalyptic and it's ref working, working through our own uh, concerns about the world we live in and technology. And, well, apocalyptic yeah. things are a big thing now. Yeah. Back in the 50s, it was these creatures that controlled you somehow. Uh, yeah. Blob that would assimilate yeah. People. That's like communism, exactly. and infiltrating, yeah. and uh, but uh, and also you know you're, they they say psychologically we're dealing with our own mortality when we look at a zombie film or they're dead but they're not dead so it's it's almost like a uh, humor a counter to our mortality. Should we advise people what is? Is it your office? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was setting up. Yeah, come and see. Yeah, it's got uh, all the Halloween accoutrement. Uh, I asked the department if it had an exorcism this year. That's been done before. I've heard that. Yeah. Well, uh, that concludes our faculty forum t today on a note of zombies and apocalyptic <laughs> literature. Uh, thanks, Mark. We appreciate you. Yeah.